Thank you for coming again. Those of you who are here for the second time. Um, I uh, talked last night about the history, in a way, of uh, Israel and Palestine from a very, the very limited perspective I was, I chose, up to 1967, 1968. So in a way, it's, an, it's appropriate to continue that history from 1968 onwards. Uh, and again, as I did last night, uh, I do it from, uh, I, I slice that reality, because that's the only thing you can do in a talk of uh, 30, 35 minutes, which covers such a complex uh, issue. Uh, whereas I uh, focused last night on the paradigm of the ethnic cleansing as, uh, as an uh, ideological infrastructure that explains the Israeli policies and before that the Zionist policies uh, towards the native indigenous population of Palestine, I would like to focus tonight on the history from 1967 and bring it as uh, as much as possible uh, to uh, the current situation through the prism of the so-called peace process. And again, this is a reductionist way of looking at things, uh, but it's a very convenient, I think, way of explaining at least my own take on the developments since 1967. The, uh, I already mentioned uh, last night, but I will repeat it for those who haven't been here, and this will be a good starting point, that the, the peace process, in a way, was conceived uh, uh, geographically between Washington and Jerusalem, or between Washington and Tel Aviv, more or less in the very last days of 1969, and the early days of 1970. And maybe it's because of my uh, professional uh, bias that I believe that however you formulate things in uh, the formative period of a process, uh, they have a lasting effect, an impact, on the nature of the process uh, in years to come. And it's very difficult to deviate from the basics that had been formulated in the departure point, uh, and in fact the only way of changing the course of the so-called peace process is to redesign it. And that will be my conclusion towards the end. That actually, if you want to get out of the deadlock, you have to go back to the desk and redraw the very basics of what is peace all about. Uh, and. Uh, it's one thing politicians, for example, cannot do. Because uh, uh, they think about a very short-term perspective. They think about the next election. Uh, they, they would never be able to engage in a fundamental process of rethinking. Uh, all they can do is try to refine the existing paradigm and, uh, and batter it to death uh, if it doesn't work. So they will try and go to the basic ideas of the peace process and say, okay, let's try it from a different angle. And then let's try it from another angle. And usually when everything collapses in a big bang, that's when they uh, are convinced that the paradigm is not valid anymore. I think we're very near that. We're very near the point that the paradigm of peace as it was conceived in 69, 1970 uh, is about to collapse, to disappear. Uh, the problem in history is that usually, uh, as in science, uh, paradigms do not replace one another immediately. There is a, a transitional period, which is quite chaotic and sometimes quite dangerous. But it's inevitable, uh, unfortunately. So what was the paradigm that dominated our life in Israel and Palestine under the uh, title The Peace Process? or as my friend Noam Chomsky calls it, the so-called peace process. <laughs> uh, and if I wasn't tired enough, every time that I would mention the peace process, I should do like this. <laughs> but, uh, I know from uh, experience as being a lecturer, 
that uh, audiences get a bit confused if you continue to do it. <laughs> and they don't know exactly how to treat this bizarre lecturer and his gesticulation. So I will try not to do it too often. In between Washington and Jerusalem, political scientists, diplomats, experts on the Arab world worked out something that the uh, Secretary of State in the 1990s, Morgan <coughs> Albright, uh, described quite well. Because as you probably know, Morgan Albright, uh, in the American revolving door kind of system, uh, like Kissinger uh, before her, <coughs> had an academic background and, and a, a diplomatic uh, uh, and, and a political <coughs> career. So she was able to articulate things both as a politician and as an academic. And I think she described it well, not critically, by the way. She, she was very much in favor of that paradigm. But I think she, she did, uh, she did uh, find the right words of uh, uh, telling us what was born there in 69, 1970 and uh, with which we are still living today. She said, in every conflict, the best you can do if you are an outside mediator or a peace broker uh, is to look at everything that is vis visible and make it divisible. Everything which is visible is divisible. Anything in a conflict which looks invisible, namely that you cannot really see, is indivisible, and therefore the peace negotiator should leave that aside. That meant, in the case of Israel and Palestine, that the most tangible aspects of the conflict were territory, which are very visible, and very easily divisible. It meant that uh, natural resources, populations, uh, anything material that uh, is on the ground can be divided. It also means, for instance, that history, ethics, morality, uh, question of culpability are not part of the equation. And in many ways, if you look at the basic Palestinian <coughs> position in 1969 and the basic consensual Israeli Zionist position in 1969-1970, you would see that if you adopt Morton Albright's idea of uh, divisibility, <coughs> you are totally siding with the Israeli side. In fact, in any conflict in the world where you have a basic imbalance of power, and usually a conflict that uh, is born uh, in situations of injustice, <coughs> such as colonization, occupation, uh, dispossession, it's quite often the victim that talks about what more than all right would describe as the invisible uh, characteristics of the conflict. And it would be the stronger party that would talk about divisibility. And not only that, you divide and you accompany the, the action of the act of division with a narrative or a dictionary or a language of concessions. You are powerful, you've occupied, you've colonized, you're in control. You are willing to divide. That's why there is a chance for peace. But you are willing to divide. That's very important. There is a willingness on your side. You are willing to concede. From the victim's point of view, all you are doing is telling them, you know, uh, we'll tolerate your existence uh, and we will stop the victimization at a certain point. But we will not in any way or form give you a chance to change the imbalance or to rectify past evils. Any one of you has uh, um, followed struggles of indigenous people here in North America, 
in uh, Australia, in New Zealand, in Latin America would understand what I'm talking about. Anyone who is following struggles of minorities in society would know what I'm talking about. This, this whole notion that the powerful party in the balance of power, if at all it adopts the language of peace, it's a language of concession, of goodwill. And um, this was adopted, I think, in 1969, 1970. More concretely, what it meant is the following. It meant that if you really wanted to involve the Israelis in the peace process, or if the Israelis themselves thought that the peace process was something that would uh, serve them well, right? If you wanted to go in that direction, you have to paint the reality of 69, 1970 as a reality in which Israel actually can continue without a peace process, but is doing a favor, maybe to the Palestinians, maybe to the Arab world, maybe to the Americans, maybe to the West, maybe to peace world, doesn't matter. But there is, there is a kind of benevolence in this act uh, because they really don't have to do this. And it meant completely that there is no historical dimension to the peace process. The peace process begins at the moment, oh, uh, sorry, the peace process deals with the conflict as if it starts at the moment that the strong party says, okay, I'm willing to engage in the peace process. So when the Israelis are willing to engage in the peace process, and that happens around 69, 1970, uh, with the, first with the William Rogers uh, initiative and then with the Kissinger initiative. So we're talking about between 1969 to 1970. Mm -hmm. It means that anything that happened up to 1969 or 1970 is not negotiable. It's not part of the story. So you negotiate, first of all, over the fate of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, if we talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, anything that is not within this geographical framework is not negotiable, not even talked about. But even if there are already established facts on the ground in 1969, and there were not that many, but there were already some established facts, like uh, the Israelis have already ethnically cleansed some neighborhoods in Jerusalem. The Israeli already declared in 67 that Jerusalem is united in uh, the Euro annexation. The Israelis have already allowed some groups of settlers to colonize small parts of the West Bank. These are not negotiable anymore because the goodwill of Israel uh, means that you negotiate over the areas where established facts have not been yet uh, uh, implemented uh, on the ground. Now, from a Palestinian perspective, it means that you need to be in such a desperate mood to accept it that it takes time, even if you're very pragmatic and you come to the conclusion that actually you have to, to do something because it's existential. By the time that you agree to enter, the negotiations. And as you know, the PLO enters the negotiations only in 1988. So it takes the PLO 20 years before it decides to engage in this game. Right? 1988, the first American PLO uh, negotiations, the uh, Palestinian Declaration of Independence, and finally, a Palestinian involvement for the first time in the peace process. The moment they agree to play the game in 1988, it means, again, that all the facts that Israel established on the ground between 1968 or 1988 are not negotiable. In fact, there is a didactic element to this, which comes very clear, clearly in the, um, in the peace proposals that are being uh, prepared in the late 1980s, even before the beginning of the Oslo process. The didactic element in this is, is the following. Since you did not agree to engage in the negotiations 
when we offered you, you are going to be offered less as part of our goodwill and concession. <laughs> and uh, uh, because you have to learn a lesson there. Uh, so to make sure that you are not delaying again your willingness to, 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 to go along with this. In, uh, until 1988, as you probably know, uh, because the Palestinians, through their main uh, legitimate and only, in a way, representative body, the PLO, were not playing the game of peace until 1988, uh, the Israelis and the Americans were playing with what one can call the Jordanian option. They sort of appointed, with the uh, voluntary agreement of the Jordanians, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan as a kind of a, a partner for such a peace. I, it, it would be a waste of time to talk about it too much. It's very clear why the, the Jordanians didn't mind playing the game. It's very clear why the Israelis preferred the Jordanians to uh, the Palestinians. And it is equally clear why it was a total failure uh, <laughs> and a waste of time and uh, in between a waste of quite a few people's life uh, with this Jordanian option. Um, but because the Israeli uh, Labour Party was very keen on this, uh, because the Americans were very keen on this, and some Arab regimes were very keen on this, the game continued. But of course, uh, uh, really, it's one of the chapters in the history of so-called peace negotiation that didn't produce anything. I mean, there are not that many cases in history where uh, 20 years of negotiations don't produce even one uh, agreement, even a marginal agreement. Now, from 1988 onwards, because the PLO, <coughs> mainly for reasons that has to do with a strategic reevaluation on the part of the Palestinian leadership, right or wrong, we can talk about it later, but they decided that because of the end of the Cold War <coughs> and the monopoly that the Americans had all over the uh, region, uh, that it was better to be involved in the Pax Americana than to reject it. Uh, was it a mistake or not? History will judge. But the fact is that in 1988, most of the people who uh, composed the leadership of the PLO <laughs> felt that uh, entering Pax Americana uh, uh, was the only option valid, uh, especially uh, because of the uh, eruption of the first uprising in December 1987, uh, the first Intifada, where it was very clear that the PLO was losing its touch with the occupied population that uh, uh, instigated its own uprising, actually singling out to the leadership uh, that uh, the time that was wasted between 67 and 1988, whether on an inefficient arms struggle or a futile diplomacy, did not change the reality on the ground, on the country. Allowed the Israelis to expropriate more land, arrest more people, demolish houses, and really uh, uh, make life quite miserable for the occupied uh, people. So I think it was a response both to the change in the global reality and the, and the impatience, if you want, uh, of the occupied people themselves that the PLO decided to try and play the game of Pax Americana. And there were two interesting American notions uh, uh, about how to manage the peace process from 1988 onwards. One was to allow the Israelis to dictate the agenda. And that idea, which is much more closer to the Democratic Party, interestingly enough, and was less popular with uh, at least some Republicans. But the Democratic Party, uh, or people who were around the Democratic Party, especially uh, liberal Jews, thought that peace meant asking the Israelis what is a consensual perception of peace that the Israelis can agree to. And that consensual perception 
uh, became very clear uh, in a while, and one can see it even today. The, the, the consensus of perception, namely the one peace initiative that you could push forward without <coughs> risking too much the integrity of the society, the cohesion of the uh, Jewish uh, uh, community inside Israel, is one which regards the West Bank and the Gaza Strip as an area that is basically divided into two zones. And these zones change with time, but not in principle. One zone is an area that has to be directly controlled by Israel, or annexed by Israel. Uh, whether these are what the Israelis nowadays call the big settlement blocks, or whether they are the settlements that look very much like cities anyway, or whether this is the Jordan Valley because of its strategic value, it doesn't matter, right? One thing it's always in, impossible to explain to the Americans <laughs> who haven't been there, how small this land is. So once you begin to slice the West Bank, which is almost uh, uh, 20, if not less, even 19% of Palestine, you begin to slice the 19% and you say part of it, even in a liberal Zionist point of view, has to be part of Israel. In terms of real square miles, not much is left, but push that aside. <laughs> but, but the idea was that part of it has to be annexed to Israel, uh, and has to be an integral part of Israel. And the language in Israel developed in the 1980s in such a way. For example, not one Israeli I know, not one Israeli Jewish I know, calls the colonized uh, 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 settlements in the Greater Jerusalem areas, Iknachluyot, settlements. They are called neighborhoods. They are an integral part of the city. And, and most Israelis really don't understand when you talk about these as settlements, which still, by the way, the State Department talks about them as settlements, illegal settlements. They are illegal settlements by, by any, any definition of international law. But, uh, the, the consensual uh, perception in Israel was that these areas were always Israel. Right? Maybe there was a, a brief moment of 19 years that they were not, but, but they were always Israel. So that's one zone. One zone is not negotiable. That's the point. In 1988, part of the West Bank is already not negotiable. Didactically, because it was an offer in 67, and the Palestinian with the famous saying of Abba Ibn, uh, never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity, and therefore, didactically, <laughs> they lost. They lost that part. And secondly, because that's the only way you can commodify, that's the only way you can package uh, what the Israelis claim would be a traumatic idea of withdrawing from the areas Israel occupied in 1967. Now, imagine from a Palestinian perspective where the whole of Palestine should be negotiated, they actually find themselves in 1988 and onwards until today already negotiating and fighting for the 50% of the 20% that is left. It's like, it's a brilliant actually act of diplomacy on Israel's side, if you want, to, to uh, make the Palestinians at least those Palestinians who were willing to engage in it, totally deviate and, and forget their basic perceptions of the reality. The other zone is negotiable. It's definitely negotiable. It can be 60% of the West Bank and the whole of the Gaza Strip. Sometimes it's 90% of the West Bank and the whole of the Gaza Strip. It changes. It changes according to the uh, Israeli strategic thinking, to the wish of the American to pressure. But there the negotiation is about how much autonomy, how much sovereignty, how much actual control would the Palestinians have on that particular uh, part. Uh, and the Israelis, contrary to what people think, already in 1988 had played the game of statehood. 
the, the, there is a clear equation that uh, becomes more uh, uh, explicit in the Oslo Accord. And the equation is the following. The more, in, in Arabic, I would say, those of you who understand Arabic, uh, the Israeli equation was uh, e even pronounced in Arabic at the time by uh, Moshe Dayan and afterwards by Rabin and others, is if you offer the Palestinian salata, they're not getting any sulta. But if they want sulta, it was with less salata. So for those of you who are, who are Anglo, Anglo-Saxons, <laughs> um, it means that if you want the perks of a state, if you want the hysteronics of the state, your real control would be very limited. If you want a bit more of a, limit, uh, of a real control, you have to give up the symbols. Right? That, that's, that's the idea. Uh, you have to choose. Do you want a flag, a palace, the charade of a state? Then, in, in, real, uh, 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 me, in, in, in reality, you would have only the perks, but not the control. If you want to have a bit more of a control, uh, then you have to give up the uh, uh, hysteronics and the charade of the state. And um, this, this was the Israeli consensus. This was the basic Israeli consensus. And it hasn't changed. Peace means an Israeli willingness to give up territorially part of the West Bank, part of the Gaza Strip, maybe the whole of the Gaza Strip. Again, Gaza Strip is 2% of, of Palestine. Uh, and the part which will not be directly controlled by Israel can be indirectly controlled in different means. And this is the end of the conflict. This is the end of the conflict. Uh, it's quite surprising how many Palestinians, for a very brief moment in history, which could be 10 years, thought that this was a serious offer throughout the years. Why did they think it was a serious offer? Out of desperation, maybe some of them without giving any names, like the idea of the Salata, the, uh, the Perks. Uh, others thought that, uh, and I know one of them who said it to me, and to others very openly of the leaders who said, if I have effective control over 2% of Palestine, this is better than nothing. These are rationalization for the worst kind of deal that you can get. But it worked for a while, and it fueled the wheels of the peace process. <clears throat> now, this was the democratic American take on peace. You go to the Israeli, Israelis, whether they are experts, whether they are diplomats, whether whoever eventually makes up the decision, and those Israelis come up with the program of peace, and I just described the logic of this program. It hasn't changed from now, from then until now. And then, of course, you have to find the Palestinians who would be willing to play with this. And you dictate to them uh, how to do this. Interestingly, the old experts on Arab affairs who hovered around the Republican Party had a different idea. And you can see it in the Madrid conference in 1991. You can see it in the things that are developed uh, under the uh, presidency of the senior Bush administration. They uh, did not accept the idea of everything which is visible is uh, uh, divisible. And they were willing, I don't know why, but they were willing to take the Palestinian perspective as a legitimate input in discussing peace. And that's why it had no chance, because the Israelis immediately stopped it. If you look, for instance, if you compare the Oslo Accord of 1993 and the Madrid Conference in 1991. The Madrid Conference, which is, which is George Bush Sr.'s uh, project, right? The Madrid Conference brings all the Arab states to the negotiating table, brings the PLO, and allows the PLO to put a Palestinian perspective of peace which can be summarized as, first and foremost, insistence, insistence on the right of the Palestinian refugees to return, 
not giving up the idea that the whole of Palestine should be liberated and turn into a democratic state, and um, the need to accept Israel uh, eventually after that is happening, or the Jewish community in Israel, as part of the Middle East. It's, it's a kind of a comprehensive deal, if you want. And this is not accepted by the Republicans. I'm not saying it was accepted, but it was legitimized as a departure point for negotiation, vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli position. And the Israelis were very worried in 1991 about this. So they uh, started the Oslo negotiations. I know because I was part of the team in those days, in 1992. I know at first hand how the Oslo agreement started. I was uh, in my sins thinking at the time that maybe my uh, communist uh, period was, was wrong and I wanted to give a chance to the Labour Party. So I was involved in those early days. So I know the things, how they developed in the, in, from within. And, and the main thing was a, a great apprehension of the kind of ideas that the Americans were pushing forward through the Madrid conference. It was really a, a, a worrying moment for, for the Israelis. And um, <coughs> uh, Shimon Peres and his advisors devised the idea of going back to the Israeli perception, or what I call the Israeli <coughs> consensual perception of peace, packaging it in a way that they hoped that the PLO would accept. And to their great surprise, the PLO, or more precisely Yasser Arafat, was quite excited about the idea. Why was he excited? Was he, did he believe them when he, they told him already in the first meetings uh, uh, in Oslo, before that in London, I remember, when they told him that the first stage of such a peace process would be totally according to the Israeli agenda. Namely, uh, he would receive as a leader of the Palestinians part of the West Bank that could become a kind of a state. And if everything works well, then the other issues, such as the refugees, the fate of the rest of the Palestinians, the fate of Jerusalem, would be discussed. But there was, again, a didactic mechanism that he accepted, or maybe he misunderstood, I don't know, but he accepted that if you behave well, the next stage is accepting the Palestinian perception. This, by the way, uh, uh, convinced those in the United States who were not so uh, uh, keen on that idea to join eventually and support the uh, Oslo peace process. Now, if you read the document, which is quite long, of the Oslo peace process, there is uh, clause number five and sub-clause number three. This should have alerted Arafat, uh, uh, and it alerted him Someone alerted him in the last moment, if you remember the scene in Cairo, where he's supposed to sign the Oslo B agreement, and he refuses. And behind the scene, Mubarak and his uh, entourage are pushing him physically, if you remember. I don't know if those of you have seen it on TV. If not, try and find it. I'm sure it's, uh, the, the footage is still there. He's being pushed physically to sign the final accord of the Oslo Accord, which was Oslo B. It's, it's, it's amazing that in only 1995, he noticed close three, sub close, uh, sorry, close five, sub close three. Close five, sub close three, which was prepared by Israeli lawyers. As I told you yesterday, the Israelis defeated the Palestinians more, not so much with military power, financial uh, competence, uh, uh, but by detailing them to death. That's the Israeli way of torturing you. They detail you to death. And that detailing to death was close five, sub close three. What does so close five, sub close three says? It says, should everything go according to plan, namely the Israeli control over the West Bank, the Palestinian half autonomy in those parts where Israel are not interested in, the Israeli security arrangement, Israeli control on the Jordan River, all the Israeli demands, should they be met without any interference from the Palestinians, five years into the Oslo Agreement, the issues which concern the Palestinians would be negotiated. Namely, the refugees, the fate of the settlements, the future of Jerusalem, 
and the uh, uh, status of the rest of the Palestinian people. It's all there. Now, if you negotiate something, and I tell you that the most sacred ideas for me are one, two, three, four, and in a document which has 55 clauses, my most sacred, most important taboos appear in clause five, sub clause three, my instinct should be that I'm being misled. But it's amazing how people were not aware of this. I remember uh, Ed, the late Edward Said and uh, uh, Hasnin Haikal, the Egyptian uh, uh, journalist, who probably would live to be 520, given the, the, the way he looks now at the age of 145. Uh, Hasnin Haikal and, and Edward Said and Ibrahim Abulur went to see Arafat in uh, Tunisia. Edward Said writes about it in his two booklets about the peace process. And they noticed, they read the agreement, and they noticed close five, sub close three. And Arafat said to them, I don't read this agreement. This is not important. What is important is the balance of power. We don't have the Soviet Union. We made a mistake in supporting the Iraqis when they occupied Kuwait. Nobody is on our side. So we'll take whatever they give us. It doesn't, but why do I have to read? And psychologically, it's so interesting that when the Israelis, two years into the Oslo Agreement, have reinterpreted close five, sub close three, reinterpreted, they said already two years into the Oslo Agreement, this is just before Rabin was assassinated. Uh, because sometimes we idealize Rabin just because he was assassinated. He was not pushing for peace. I can assure you. He was not pushing for peace. He was pushing for the Israeli version of peace, which had nothing to do with peace. It has to do with submiss with occupation in other means. And that, that's another story. But in any case, two years into the Oslo Agreement, the Israelis say, we already know that you're not going to keep your promise to behave. Now, objectively, one should say that the rejection uh, in Palestine to the uh, uh, Oslo Agreement was manifested in a series of uh, 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 suicide bombing, uh, uh, demonstrations, armed uh, opposition, so the Israelis could accumulate evidence that uh, the Palestinian uh, 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 leadership is not keeping its side. So already into that agreement, they interpreted, interpreted, reinterpreted, close five, sub close three, by saying, because of your inability to keep your <coughs> promise, A, we don't know for how long we're going to postpone the next stage of the final status, but far more important, we have a new idea. We'll divide that area that uh, you will have, which is much smaller than the area we were willing to give you, again, because you were missing opportunities, into two areas, area uh, 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 B and C. Area A is totally our control. B and C, or the other way around, doesn't matter, as long as you <laughs> remember the three categories. B is a joint control of us and your security forces. The other one is supposedly total control by the Palestinians. <coughs> now, in terms of percentage, I don't want to bore you too much. I don't want to detail you to death. Um, <laughs> Not, not much is left as independent Palestinian control in the end of it. And that's, that's kind of a punishment to the Palestinians. The, the idea of Oslo B, as it was called, areas A, B, and C, was a punishment for not fulfilling the promise in clause 5, sub clause 3. And when Arafat was asked to sign it, if you remember, in the theater hall in Cairo, those of you who were watching it as I did, he suddenly didn't want to sign it. And he was forced to do it. I, 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 it's a picture that doesn't leave me uh, uh, all my life, I, I, because I knew the man and I knew many people around him, and it was, it, it was quite dramatic, what one should say that. Now, it's interesting that at that stage, when it's very clear that this whole elaborate edifice that the Israelis have built together with the Americans, which is 
how to dictate to the Palestinians an occupation by other means and declare it as a final peace. This was the formula. When this failed actually in 1995, also because of Rabin's assassination and the election of the Netanyahu government, but also because it had never had any chance of being, to be a reality, right? And the result, as you know, was the uh, growing of the Hamas, the, the Islamic, political Islamic opposition to the Oslo uh, airport. I don't have to tell you all the details on the ground, 1996, 1997. The interesting thing is the inertia of politicians. Every student, first year student of political science, every history student, every perceptive, intelligent, and even not so intelligent person would in 1996 say, this paradigm is not working. Some would say it's not working because it's unjust. Others would say it's not working because we can see the facts on the ground, it's not working. And the facts on the ground, as you know, included not just the failure of implementing the clauses, but the expansion of the Jewish settlement, the expropriation of land, the imprisonment of Palestinians, and the Palestinian reaction through suicide bombs and uh, other means. So, so it, even if you did not judge it ethically or morally, you could see that practically it's not working. But this is the inertia of politicians and diplomats. Nobody among those who had the power to offer anything new had dared to say there's something wrong with the paradigm. They kept adopting the paradigm to the changing reality rather than allowing the reality to force them to change the paradigm. So the, the paradigm in 1997, in 1998, looks even more ridiculous. There's a stage in the conflict uh, in Camp David in the summer of 2000, when uh, Ehud Barak, who has a minority government in Israel, which means, again, practically, that it doesn't matter what he would agree in Camp David, he would not be able to pass it through the Israeli political system. So it didn't even matter whether there would have been an agreement between Clinton and Arafat and Barak in the summer of 2000. That doesn't matter. But the paradigm means that they play as if it, there is a chance. And they try to repackage the paradigm in the following way. They change the percentage. It's a, it's a clever game. You know, the Israelis worked on it for five months. <laughs> for five months, they repackaged their perception of peace while the Palestinians were doing nothing at the time. It didn't matter. In the end of the day, it didn't matter. They didn't do anything. The Palestinians, by the way, in the last moment, uh, 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 approached the Adam Smith Institute in London and asked them to prepare a counter master plan to the Israeli plan for the summer of 2000. I know because the Adam Smith Institute approached me to help and write the, 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 the chapter on the refugees. Uh, it, it was pathetic, both if you know what the Adam Smith Institute is and the fact that the Palestinian region <laughs> needed a right-wing think tank in London to help them to prepare for, for that uh, uh, pathetic meeting in Kandahar. But that doesn't matter. What really matters is how the Israeli packaged the, the New Deal. The New Deal was the following. You take out the Greater Jerusalem area from what you call the West Bank, right? Which is almost one-third of the West Bank. And then you say, you, you prevent the narrative of the most generous F offer ever been made by Israel to the Palestinians. I hope you understand the arithmetics. It's a bit late in the day. It's not <laughs> that complicated, right? I, I'm, I'm about to offer you actually 50% of something, but because I squeeze that something, the 50% look like 70%, right? That's what they did. They take the greater Jerusalem area out of the equation and they say, which they are next to Israel, right? <laughs> and say the two thirds are the complete West Bank, and out of this new complete West Bank, which is just two thirds of the West Bank, <laughs> we are giving you almost 95%. There isn't one Israeli Jew I know, and there isn't one American supporter of Israeli Jews that I know, that wouldn't tell you that in Camp David 2000, the Palestinians were offered almost 97% of the West Bank. Am I right? 
I mean, you can, you can, if you don't believe me, just open the website of the Israeli embassy in Washington. 90, this was a generous offer. Mm -hmm. They were offered 97%. They were not offered 97%. They were offered uh, uh, much less. Sec the second repackaging, it's amazing how what people allow themselves. The second repackaging was redefining the idea of sovereignty in a way that you wouldn't find even in the most uh, amateurish and, uh, 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 and sloppy political science book definition of a state. They redefined statehood in a way that the mayor of Madison looks like really a president of the United States compared <laughs> to what would look the, the president of the Palestine that was offered in Camp David. And it's, it's, it's incredible. Now, Arafat, as you know, in 2000 was very <clears throat> fragile. And, and the fact that uh, Barack, uh, you remember the picture, he, he pushes him forcefully, <laughs> I think didn't help. Uh, probably that's what killed him in the end of the day. Uh, and not the Israeli poison. The um, <laughs> Arafat looked at that, and even he understood that this was too much. The, the, the game was so clear. Now, the Israeli re repackaged the package in Taba. Probably this narrative is important. It is important to know it. The Israelis take the Palestinians to Taba in the Sinai and say, no, wait a minute, we, we want to be even more generous. And, uh, uh, and they, they say, we're even willing to allow you to uh, uh, a return of s a small number of refugees to show you, remember close five, sub close three, that we are willing to deal with sub close five, sub close three. But you have two options. And if you think about it, <coughs> this is all so stupid, but it was taken very seriously. You have two options, the liberal Zionists said. You can either allow 100,000 refugees out of 5.5 million to go back, and that's it. Or you can take uh, back the refugees only to that part which would be eventually Palestine, which is one third or the two thirds, or the two <laughs> thirds of the five thirds, and, and so on. Which not much is that. I mean, the cheese, uh, the Swiss cheese that uh, was supposed to be uh, Palestine. And this is a more generous offer, offer than the generous offer, right? This is the best generous offer ever, ever made. The frustration of the Palestinians, even those who went as pragmatically as they could with their ideas, came out in the Second Intifada. Of course the Second Intifada was much more violent than the first one. The frustration was much bigger. And, and, uh, and what do the powers that be, uh, 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 how do they respond? By changing the paradigm? You have a second uprising? Do they change the paradigm? On the contrary. They say, oh, we have to twit the paradigm again. There's a new reality. And then you have the roadmap that leads to nowhere. <laughs> then you have all kinds of plans that come under the names of officials in the State Department, if you notice. Now, if you look from 2000 to 2011, the names of the program are attached to less and less senior officials in the State Department. <laughs> the more you, the time passes by, the less senior is the official in the State Department <laughs> under which the new plan is, is, is named. Because everybody understands this is not a very important issue. Bush, the second, junior, already gives up the game anyway. Uh, because he is a Republican. When the Democrats come uh, before the Clinton and, and Obama, and this is the worst thing about the Obama administration, Obama has brought back all the wizards of Oz uh, from the Clinton administration to repackage for the fifth time this horrible commodity, which is called the peace process. And they're really surprised that there's no one to talk to, not even on the Israeli side. This is not because the Israeli political map has swung, uh, has, has, has moved to the right. That's not the reason. Even the Israelis cannot stand anymore the repackaging. Can you imagine? I mean, you, you take. You, you take sour milk from the fridge, and you add sugar, and then you add salt, <laughs> and then you add eggs, and then you put it outside in the heat, and then you freeze it, and you defreeze it. Who can, you can't smell it anymore. And that's what happened to the so-called peace process. And unfortunately, on the ground, nobody is offering anything new. This is still the dominant narrative. The peace process is still the dominant narrative. <laughs>
On top of it, they appointed uh, Tony Blair to be the main emissary that has to now resell this sour milk to us as a peace process. You know, appointing Tony Blair to the peace process is like appointing Dracula to have a, a blood bank. <laughs> I mean, they have something in common. They have something in common, but you wouldn't trust the one in the hands of the other. And, 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 and everybody sees it, and yet it doesn't move. Now, let me finish by saying the following. The fact that there is such a gap between the deliberations, the discussions on the so-called peace process, which feed academics, diplomats, politicians, and there's a gap with the old time is growing, and the reality on the ground, which is more occupation, more oppression. Because the gap is so big, it's very clear that we are somewhere on the road to the disappearance of that paradigm. Not again because somebody would sit down logically and say we need a new paradigm, but because there's, there is there's a limit. I, I wrote somewhere that the uh, uh, United Nations uh, discussion on the state of Palestine is the end of the two, uh, of this part. It is the end of this paradigm because uh, there's nothing more bizarre than a United Nations endorsement for a paradigm that does not exist. The Americans support it, the Russians support it, now the United Nations support it, and it, they support a non-existing idea, right? So people would have to uh, bring up a new idea. The new idea is not easy to produce. It's easy to write about, but it's not easy to produce. But I really see no other choice than for everybody concerned to go back to the desk and in many ways go back to the ideas of the Madrid conference and say, this conflict has a history. And its origins is the source of the illness. Everything that came afterwards is the symptoms. If you don't deal with the refugee issue, if you don't deal with the fate of the whole of the land that was Palestine, if you don't include all the Palestinians in that negotiations, the paradigm would be the same. You cannot shrink Palestine geographically, and you cannot shrink Palestine demographically. The more you ex include the territory and the demography in it, the more you have a chance of solving uh, the problem. Now, I'm not naive. I know that this is anathema to most Israelis and to most of those who are engaged in the peace process. But I think that either through the realities, or rather disastrous realities on the ground, or hopefully through a kind of pressure from below, uh, the, par the false paradigm of parity the false paradigm of the peace process would be replaced by a paradigm that is far more authentic, far more relevant to the reality on the ground, and which is based on uh, not on parity, but on equality, which is a very different notion. Equality of citizen rights, of human rights, uh, whether you are a settler or you are indigenous, it doesn't matter. The, human, the, the, the equal rights is something that also has a, in a, way, a way of dealing with history, but also looking forward towards the future. And I will end by saying, in order to re-describe, to repackage my own paradigm, with three A's, which I think are the basis for the future. Three A's. One is acknowledgement. Unless the Israelis would acknowledge the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948 and all the ethnic cleansing uh, policies and operations since 1948, there will never be peace. That's acknowledgement. The second A is accountability. You, acknowledgement is not enough. You have to be accountable. And the best way to translate accountability in the case of the Israelis uh, is first and foremost to recognize, at least in principle, the right of the Palestinian refugees to, to return. The third A is acceptance. I think it's the Palestinian agency in this is to accept the ethnic Jewish community that developed in the last 62 years, or maybe in the last 100 years, as a legitimate part of the solution, uh, which is not easy for Palestinians and, and neighboring Arab societies to accept. 
But I think that if you have acknowledgement, accountability, you will also have that uh, acceptance. Uh, this, to my mind, are the only guiding uh, principles for those who should build the new paradigm from scratch in the case of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thank you. Because I know, I would think about a similar thing would be like labeling the negotiations between Mandela and the ruling white party a peace process. And that's something that the Palestinian American, because my father's, my father's Palestinian, I don't think people in this room, but when I deal with the average American population, they come to me having the paradigm in their head of two equal sides, two equal standing armies, just like the, the, the Soviet American conflict. And, and they're completely misguided on this. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think you, you, you're right. Part of the sustainability of the wrong paradigm is the ability to commodify it for a long time as a successful venture, uh, and a logical venture. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think if you look at the early discussions, and they are now open, especially in something which is called the Foreign Relations of the United States, which are volumes, which are open to the public in the uh, National Archives. If you look at this, the departure point of the Americans and the Israelis, of course there are no Palestinians involved, the departure point of the Americans and the Israelis who conceive uh, the paradigm it's in its very early form is we are westernized, we are logical, we are enlightened, we are part of modernity. Therefore, we know even better than the Palestinian what is good for them. <laughs> and what we offer is very logical. It comes from a business school. You know, uh, partition is come from. If both of you want this room, I'll divide it. Uh, both of you have a claim, I'll partition it, right? Now, of course, if you think about it, even from a business point of view, if I come to you and say to you, you know, this, the room is 100%, because I'm a good businessman, and you are a good businessman, you would agree with me that it's nothing better than I would have 80% and you have 20%. This is the best offer, <laughs> really. Now, this is when I'm in a good mood. Maybe this is my peace, <laughs> this is my peace camp. This is, I'm almost an anti-Zionist when I give you 20%. Now, if I'm in the center of Zionism, if I'm in the right of Zionism, I'm gonna give you 5%. Actually, not even that, okay? Now, even at the beginning, nobody paid attention to this. Nobody paid attention that even the internal logic of the peace offer had a very terrible idea as a business proposal. 20% to one side, which is the indigenous side, the, uh, the native side, and 80% and to the other side, regardless of whether it was a settler or not considered to be a settler colonialist. Movement. Now, the moment you reject the 20%, you prove that you are not part of modernity. You prove that you are an Arab or a Muslim, which is worse. <laughs> that means you, 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 you don't use any logic. You are a very emotional person. You think that 20% are not fair. <laughs> and, and that narrative is built over. In fact, it, it works so well that I remember uh, um, American, you, you know, you know your, your, your media here, and it's not only your media, but you are leading. Uh, our ideas of what is a good media, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> you, you have this idea of, you can do in a sound bite the whole history of a place, you know? Whenever, uh, I don't know, an, an Israeli settler is being hurt on the foot, so there is a headline, and they give in a sound bite the history. And if you listen to that history, you really have the impression that uh, the Palestinians have occupied Israel, that the Israelis are fighting a war of liberation against the Palestinian occupation, and that the last peace proposal was 80% for the Palestinian, 20% for, for the Israelis. And, and this is working because you begin by saying there's a logical, modern, Western side that has to deal with something which is exactly the opposite. So, so I, I agree. I, I think Edward Said used to say it. You, you have to deprogram. You have to deconstruct, in fact, the project of modernity if you want to defeat Zionism. It's not that concrete. It's not just a problem of giving a counter narrative to the Zionist narrative. You have to challenge the whole, the basic assumptions 
of the project of modernity to make it work. Uh, and uh, it's quite a formidable uh, Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, do you think this whole peace process on the part of the Israelis is really a charade, that they're doing this to appease the Americans, and that um, they're just trying to make this more difficult so that they can gain more and more of the land of the, the occupied land, and eventually they'll have the whole area and they will have um, cleansed all of the occupied area of the Palestinians on a gradual basis, which they wouldn't dare to do immediately. I think it's a bit more complex. That's why I like to connect my two talks. Uh, of yesterday and today. I, I think that this conflict has two dimensions for the Israelis. A geographical dimension and a demographic dimension. In 1967, actually, the geographical dimension disappeared. The Israelis didn't have any more geographical problems. They had the whole of Palestine under their control. They were left with the real problem, the demographic problem. You have the whole land you wanted, but there are too many of the people you don't want. The peace process works in two ways on two different kinds of Israelis. You have the Israelis who are genuinely, I call them diet Zionists or liberal Zionists, you can call them whatever you want. They really believe that this is peace. They would be very much aware, by the way, if you would try an intellectual game with them and you would offer them a different case study, right? And you said, would you regard this as a peace process in a different location or different period of history, they would not accept it. But in their case, it's peace. It's peace that allows them to have a smaller part of Palestine, if necessary, but with fewer Palestinians as possible. The other Israelis do not think that peace is on the agenda at all. There is unilateral Israeli dictation, uh, and it's weakness, actually, to go on a peace process. Um, the point is that the Labour Party, that was the hegemonic political power in Israel, understood from 1967 onwards that if you want to make it easier for the Americans to square the circle, to have both an unconditional support for Israel and keeping safeguard safeguarding the American interests in the Arab world, you have to inflate this, the, 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 the discourse of peace, the talk about peace. Right? And you have to make, make it even look more dramatic than it was. Um, you, you know, there's a famous letter from uh, the uh, American uh, 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 President Johnson to Israel, uh, to the Israeli government, when he, he learns that Israel is annexing officially Jerusalem, a few days after the Six Days War. A very angry letter. Very angry letter that really... Uh, undermines for a moment the confidence of the Israeli government. He is really willing to go very far with this. So they concoct an answer which uh, my friend Avi Schlein wrote about it in the Iron Wall, which was told to the fabrication. And the question is only whether the Americans knew it was a fabrication or not. They said to the Americans, oh, don't worry. This is just in order to satisfy certain demands in the Israeli public. Everything will be open for negotiation. And now everybody knew they didn't mean it. Now the Americans, I think, chose, as Abish Lane rightly says, I think, chose to ignore it. They knew that they were be being misled several times after '67. So I think that 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 that's that's how the inertia creates a certain fabrication, and then you start to believe your own lies, your own lies. The Israelis really have a perception of themselves as being a peace-loving nation offering the Palestinians a Bantustan in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip is an indication of a peaceful nation for them. Yes, please. Yes. Why is it okay that there are one million Arab citizens of Israel that have representation in government, but with Israelis still have homes in Judea and Samaria, it's seen as this really evil bad thing? Okay. First of all, the Israeli uh, uh, Palestinians are one million and a half, and they don't have any representation in the government. They have representation only in the parliament. Uh, no Israeli uh, government would be would have uh, 
You'll never have a Palestinian prime minister, or minister of defense, or minister of foreign affairs. Uh, secondly, the Israelis, uh, 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 Palestinians, or the Palestinians in Israel are second-rate citizens. They are uh, second-rate citizens according to the law. They are second-rate citizens because the emergency regulation that Israel has can be operated against them, and only against them, at any given moment, which means uh, emergency regulation means that the military control over the Palestinian areas can take place uh, in effect from the moment the government decides upon it. And military governance means that you have no rights at all. And they are also uh, being uh, mistreated on a daily uh, contact between the whoever represents the authorities and uh, the government and, and the Palestinian citizens. So first of all, I, I don't think uh, they are treated fairly and definitely they are discriminated against. Now, they are in a very different position than the settlers that according to international law, illegally settled in an occupied area. According to the uh, Hague Convention, you, a government is not allowed to transfer uh, citizens of its own nation to the occupied area. So uh, in a way, even if the Palestinians would have treated these settlers better, uh, uh, they would not be allowed to do it according to the international law. The reality on the ground is, is of course, worse. <coughs> the settlers are supported by the army in harassing and in, uh, uh, in abusing the rights of the Palestinians uh, on the land. So I think any comparison between the Jewish settlers in the occupied West Bank to the Palestinian minority in Israel has to take into account the discrimination against the Palestinians inside Israel and the illegality of the settlers' presence in the occupied territories. Oh, yes, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, three uh, questions which are somewhat, um, uh, how can I say, uh, controversial, but I would be interested to have your mm -hmm. perspective yeah. and your knowledge on these three questions. Yeah. Uh, first of all, um, I would be curious to know what uh, you could tell us about uh, the figure of Moses Hess. Uh, Moses Hess, which was uh, who thought was uh, at the origin both of communism and also of Zionism, one of the uh, early thinkers of communism and Zionism. Do you have any interesting, have you done, um, done any interesting research on Moses Hess? Uh, are there any, is there anything um, interesting you can tell us about him? Uh, another question is the figure, I'm very interested in British history, uh, the figure of Lord uh, Alfred Milner, and who was uh, allegedly behind uh, the Balfour Declaration, um, and his ideology, his influence, do you talk, uh, uh, talk about his influence in the, the creation of Israel? And one third question. Um, I've studied a bit the Lavon affair, mm -hmm. Lavon affair, and we mentioned as well yesterday the USS Liberty. Yeah. And uh, is it reasonable to consider or to define the Lavon affair as a false flag operation? And if so, is it reasonable to uh, consider that false flag operations um, are still perhaps conducted, conducted in the 21st century? Yeah. Um, I'm not very knowledgeable about uh, Moshe Hess, so I'm, I'm afraid that I can't tell you anything. Probably no more than I do. I, I, I didn't study him. Uh, he, he does sound like an intriguing figure. So uh, Alfred Milner. Uh, I can say something more, I hope, profound about it. I think the whole, Miller is responsible together with, uh, for, uh, together with Balfour to this very interesting uh, period uh, in the British uh, Empire history that produced the Balfour Declaration. I think people um, uh, 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 do not notice two aspects of the Balfour Declaration which Miller was responsible for uh, in many ways. Uh, one is that the Basel Declaration was given at a time when quite a lot of Jews were leaving Eastern Europe and coming to England. And the British uh, uh, officials like Milner regarded this as a very unwelcome group of immigrants. 
So Milner's idea of, of supporting the Balfour Declaration was more than anything else to stop the migration of Jews to the United Kingdom. These were poor Jews, uh, East European Jews. Uh, uh, he, he, he had a lot of respect for the Anglo-Jewish community, but he thought that this was bad for Britain. And the idea that these Jews would come directly to Palestine uh, seemed to him a very good idea. The second part of it is Milner was very close to Lord George, uh, the Prime Minister, who was a devout Christian. And uh, uh, Lord George definitely believed that, this, that the return of the Jews to Palestine was part of a, a, a divine scheme. So I think if you study Milner, uh, you could see that he, uh, he injects into the British decision eventually to give the Balfour Declaration uh, these two elements. There were other elements which had nothing to do with Miller. There were the elements of thinking that the Jews would control the Bolshevik movement, and therefore there was a confusion between Zionism and Bolshevism, and so on. Uh, the last question, the Lavon affair, maybe not everybody knows what the Lavon affair is, so we should say this. Uh, uh, the Israeli uh, Secret Service uh, convinced a, a group of Egyptian Jews in 1955 to plant some bombs in uh, uh, institutions that were closely connected to the United, the United Kingdom, Britain, and France in order to convince uh, Britain not to leave Egypt. And these people were caught before planting the bombs, actually, so the bombs never exploded. They were caught because someone informed upon, uh, on them. Uh, and, uh, these, uh, and there was a big debate in Israel who gave the order for this uh, futile uh, attempt. And Ben-Gurion uh, 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 used it in order to get rid of someone he didn't like, Mr. Lavon, who was a famous leader of the Mapai, of the ruling party. And he dragged this, this uh, affair dragged into the 60s and actually caused a, a serious uh, uh, division in the Israeli labor movement because of that voting attempt. You ask if this is still going on today, Oh, um, there's several, several things, of course. Um, of course, 9-11 is, I find 9-11 quite suspicious, but this is my opinion. Yeah. However, uh, the recently we've witnessed uh, in the media uh, this story about an ambassador, Saudi ambassador. I, I tell you what, maybe we'll come back to it, because maybe okay. the other people want to ask okay. questions, OK? Uh, but uh, yeah, it can happen today. Let's put it this way. Yes, please. Lately, we've been hearing a lot about a lot of saber rattling with uh, Israel, with uh, uh, Iran, you know, about possibly uh, attacking Iran. Do you right. think they'd be crazy enough to do that, number one, or what you think about all that? <laughs> You know, I'm an historian. I predict about the past. You want me to predict about uh, the, the, the no, no, future? No, no, no. I mean, just the yeah. The no, no, listen, I, I, to be serious, not to be yeah. very okay. serious. I, I think that the current trio that runs Israel, uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu, Lieberman, the Foreign Minister, and Ehud Barak, the Minister of Defense, together with the new Chief of Staff that they have, are capable of doing it. Not only they're capable. I am pretty sure that they are planning something. Uh, I can't tell you what because I don't know what that plan. Wouldn't that be suicide? Ah, well, who knows? Who knows? Uh, it depends what they are planning. It depends what kind of retaliation there will be. Uh, how long would the retaliation on both sides continue? I don't know. I know. I can. I can agree with you that this is insane. <laughs> I also can tell you that I'm sure. Without, I'm not saying it out of knowledge. I'm guessing. There's quite a few serious people in the army, and I can judge from what the former head of the Mossad is saying, that quite a few of the professionals in Israel are opposing this idea. But I remember that in 1982, the whole professional institutions, and security institution and establishment in Israel opposed the idea of occupying Lebanon in 1982. And it didn't make, it didn't impress Menachem Begin. <laughs> And, or Ariel Sharon. So well, let me put it this way. It's more likely that Israel will attack than not. Uh, it's much more likely. That doesn't mean that it's going to happen for sure. Uh, it also seems that the Americans have given up on their ability to stop the Israelis. Uh, when will it happen? How will it happen? If it's going to happen, 
I'll go for the back and then I'll come back okay. to you. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, in the, uh, in the past few months we've seen uh, massive demonstrations uh, within Israel That's with right. regard to the uh, failure, protests against the neoliberal agenda uh, and imposed austerity. Right. And I've been in discussions here uh, regarding what this might mean in terms of implications, ramifications for the Palestinians. Um, you see any such, and if so, what might they be? Right. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, for the time being, this very interesting protest movement does not seem to have a direct implication for the situation uh, in Palestine or with the Palestinians. It seems to be a kind of an internal Jewish-Israeli uh, discontent. If you want, these are people who are angry with the way that the spoils have been divided, but they have no problem with the spoils by the fact that these spoils were illegally taken. Um, however, this can develop because it shows lack of confidence in the uh, political and financial elite in Israel. It doesn't show lack of confidence in the military elite. Namely, they say you have misled us on issues that have to do with economy, finance, society. If they don't say you have misled us on the issue of security, right? In fact, if you notice, the main speeches in Tel Aviv, in the Occupy Tel Aviv kind of uh, uh, movement, was, I'm a good Israeli, I served in the army, I did my duty, and so on. And they stopped the protest when Israel was having this mini attack on Gaza for a while. So these are bad signs that this protest movement is not engaging with the core issues. Nevertheless, we have to be careful. And again, I say this as a historian. It, it, they, cannot, they may not want to get there, but they might get there without wanting. So it's a positive thing. It is a positive thing. Uh, it is not the indication for transformation from within. Put it this way. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Um, yesterday, you said, and I think, and I would agree, that in the long run, this is simply an unsustainable course of action. That the combination of the demography and the uh, precariousness, I mean, as sometimes it's said, Israel could win 99 out of 100 wars, right. and then eventually things fall apart. Now, my question is, what are the, what is the elite in Israel actually thinking about the future? I mean, do they actually, simply say you're wrong about that, that they believe they can have an armed state that's sufficiently powerful that it can forever, I mean, they have a 2,000-year-old memory about the past, but a 20-year future. I mean, what's the, what's their time horizon? It's, it's very difficult to, um, to explain to people. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a product of the Israeli uh, educational uh, industrial line, a flawed product. Uh, it's very difficult to explain, but I will try. I don't think they use the same language that you're using in your very articulate question. It doesn't work that way. If, if, you, if, if, they would, if their departure point for analyzing the situation would be your departure point, they would be in a deadlock, and they would say you're right. But that's not the departure point. You have to look at it different. Their departure point is the following. This is a no choice situation. We have no choice. That's amazing. There's no choice. We, we have to live here. We have to live here because nobody wants us around the world. And nobody wants us here. So we have to be very powerful. And life here is a constant struggle with this fact that you have to struggle for survival all the time. So the question is, and it's a big question, I'm sharing it with you. I mean, that's my dream, is to come to Israel and find a way of deprogramming that. <laughs> the question is, is there any way that a member of that elite would go the same way that I did? And I described it in the book, Out of the Frame, where you suddenly say, wait a minute, the departure point is also manufactured. It's also constructed. 
It's not the reality. You're being brought up in Israel, and I know it, believe me, I know it. Not to say that the departure point is the reality. It's, it's a given that nobody wants you, that there's no choice. Now, if you take this as a given, your options are very limited. How far can you be as a liberal or a peace-loving person if this is the departure point? If my departure point is that everybody in this hall, I hope it's not correct, uh, because it happens to me in America a lot, <laughs> that everybody in this hall wants to kill me, right? If this is my departure point, how benevolent can I be towards you? I mean, if you just move your hand, I will shoot you, <laughs> right? Now, I may be more liberal, so I will allow you to raise your hand a little bit more than a more fanatic Jew would do. But you, you see what I'm trying to say? This is, now you have to understand, this is, you, in Israel you are being indoctrinated from cradle to the grave. And I think you have been indoctrinated even before you are being born. So it comes back through the prenatal kind of uh, reality. And, and uh, as someone who's liberated himself from this, I can tell you how, how strong it is. It's not coerced. It's not coerced upon you, but it works. It works because there's a genuine fear. There is uh, an objective reality. I mean, I hit you and you hit me back and I say, you see, you are a guy who hits. So I'm in a real danger. Uh, so there is an objective explanation of what I'm going through. So, so I think, to make it shorter, my, my answer is, the Israelis would tell you, of course we are not, we can lose a war and this would be the end, as you would say at night. But, do you see any other way forward? And you say, yes, of course, you know, you can negotiate. And you say, we try to negotiate. We had such a brilliant, generous offer, <laughs> and they rejected it. Now they're all fanatic Muslims anyway. <laughs> you know, there is a set of answers to all your questions. I, I, I did a home university in my, in, my, in my house when I lived in Israel with intelligent professionals from the area of Haifa. And I understood this was a departure point. There was nothing I could do unless I worked with them for a whole year and they began to doubt the departure point. I had to bring many Palestinian friends for that to happen. I had to take them to see Nazareth, which is 10 minutes from where they live and they have never visited, and promise them that they will come back alive. <laughs> this is, this is, this is a very powerful, the most powerful indoctrination I've seen, as uh, uh, Michel Foucault used to say. As you know, uh, when you use force, uh, it's, it's obvious that it's a fabrication. But when you use power, when I make you think, when I make you do things that you think that you want to do, I'm much more powerful than using force. And, and the Israeli indoctrination is fascinating. It's really fascinating, and it, it, it's much more tragic than fascinating because I'm part of it. But it, it's it's something that you have to take into account uh, as part of the engagement of Israel, and that's why I think that sometimes in such cases, a big bang on the head <laughs> is not a bad idea. Not bad. Uh, let me take the later. Yeah, one more. Sorry? We should probably one more. We should, oh, okay, sorry. So you'll be there. Um, considering that the U.S.-Israel relationship is so important for Israel to get away with what it does, and considering that Israel is in the middle of a very oil-rich region, and oil is very important, and um, why does you, the U.S., do you think, support Israel since it, that relationship antagonizes uh, Arab countries in that area so much. And I ask this partly because there's kind of a divide on the left about this. So there's people like uh, Mayor Scheimer and others who mm -hmm. say it's Apex influence, and then Chomsky and others who disagree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, I would say two things about the American support for Israel. First of all, I think it is a triangle. I think the American support for Israel stands on three legs. Uh, and they are discrete. They have nothing in common, but uh, they are united when it comes to, to the fact of Israel. And that's why they're so powerful. One, one uh, 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 pillar is the Christian Zionism. 
and I said it yesterday, it begins long time before the creation of the State of Israel, in the early 19th century. It's really part of a certain Christian belief that the presence of the Jews in Palestine is a divine scheme. There are different interpretations for this, there are different levels of convictions about it, but if you read the, read, uh, the, the, the literature on both sides of the Atlantic, by the way, mm. both sides of the Atlantic, you see it's very powerful. It's very, very powerful. The second pillar is the Jewish lobby, APAC, and the third one is the industrial military complex. Now, the interesting part is the industrial military complex, because what you say is that at least that pillar should have a problem, because if you support Israel, you may not do good businesses with the Saudis and the Qataris and military regimes. Well, you would be wrong if you would say it. You can do businesses with them and support Israel. The big question is what will happen in the Arab world after the Arab Spring? When regimes and countries in the Arab world would reflect a democratic public opinion, which would say, no, no, you can't do the same. You cannot be our friend and support Israel at the same time. It doesn't work anymore. Now, still, the support for Israel would lie, rely on these two other pillars that, that, that I mentioned. Um, I hope that I'm not wrong in thinking that actually the Jewish pillar is far more shaky than the Christian Zionist one. That's my impression, <laughs> that the young Jewish generation uh, shows signs of of doubts about it. They are not indoctrinated, they are indoctrinated, but not in the same way as, as Israeli Jews are. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, the last pillar would be Christian Zionism. But by itself, I don't think it would be enough to sustain the kind of support that uh, Israel has. But it takes time, it takes time. And uh, for the time being, there are no signs that any of this pillar is seriously uh, eroded. It's potentially speaking about it. Uh, so I think that in this debate between Mishmeyer and, uh, and Ch Noam and Chomsky, as, as I tried to show in the joint book with Chomsky uh, that, I, that we've written, I, I think that they both have a very valid point, that it shouldn't exclude one of the pillars for the sake of it. Um, and there is, I have to admit, there is something also irrational and not totally expla explainable. I mean, once, once you are enough in the... Uh, Church of Brain, which is the secular academia, you, believe, you, you understand that the worst thing that has been done to you after years of being in an academic institute, that you really believe that everything is ex explainable. You have to. You don't get tenure if you don't believe that everything is explainable. Your students don't respect you if you don't tell them that everything is explainable. But this is nonsense, of course. The American support of Israel has metaphysical uh, <laughs> dimensions. I remember going with Chomsky to Capitol Hill to meet the one, I won't say his name, the one senator who was willing to meet us. We had to meet in this tunnel that connects the, <laughs> the House of Representatives and uh, whatever, and we got lost there because uh, he didn't want to be seen. He, he made himself as he was going to the washroom to meet us. <laughs> he, was, he was a very powerful senator. God knows what he was afraid of, but the timidity mm -hmm. of people in this country when it comes to Israel, is not uh, in the realm of logical explanation. You need uh, healers, metaphysical shamans, all kinds of, go, go to the Native Americans, I think they will have a better explanation for the, the, the way people cower here when it comes to Israel. It's, it's, it's beyond, you know, even Israelis are amazed at how powerful they are at Capitol Hill. They don't believe their luck. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe it's time for Americans to wake up and say, <coughs> we should be, stop being anti-Semitic. The Jews don't, are not that powerful as we think, which is an anti-Semitic idea. They're not as powerful. <laughs> and it's time just to say no once. It's so liberating. You say no once, you say no twice. That's all you need. That's all you need. Uh, and once you have that, also, the last European bastions would say no uh, to Israel. It's, it's, uh, but that's my only explanation.